15 minutes to cover 17 years and half the world, so uh, I'm going to get this started. So uh, this is my boat, Wild Eyes. Uh, there are those who would argue, and I might be a little biased, but I'd say that she's the most amazing boat in the whole entire world. Maybe not anymore, she's uh, missing a mast. <laughs> this is my route. For those of you who know of me just because of the wreck in the middle of the Indian Ocean, I um, left from Maria del Rey, headed down to Cabo San Lucas, then uh, around Cape Horn, then uh, headed up pretty fast to try and stay out of rough weather, across the Atlantic Ocean, then had to pull into Cape Town for repairs, out of Cape Town, about two to three weeks was, you know, the exact middle of the Indian Ocean where I was wrecked. Was taken down to Kerguelen by a French fishing ship, and then hopped on another ship and taken to Reunion Island. And from Reunion Island, I uh, went to Paris, and from Paris, I went home. You know, it took me about 24 hours to get home from a place that had taken me four months to get to. It's a little bit depressing when you think about it, really. So when I was first asked to speak here, I wasn't entirely sure how I was gonna, you know, I heard that the theme of this was energy, and I never really thought about my trip from that aspect. But uh, when I thought about it a little bit, that's kind of what the whole thing was. It was managing energy and, you know, the power of the wind and the ocean and all of that. And that's my boat while I was there, and this is solar panels at the back and two wind generators and then more solar panels up front. And that's how I ran all my electronics. This is just a little diagram of, you know, solar panels and wind generators, went to the batteries and ran my little command station here, which is where I spent most of my time. You can pretty much run everything on the boat except for the sails from right there. And when you're down south and it's freezing cold, you don't want to spend too much time outside. This is Wild Eyes. A um, bit of a story behind the name, but I'll get to that later. And this is my team. You know, it's probably one of the biggest parts of my trip was having such an amazing team on board with me. I had experts in every field and, you know, I was with them through every, everything they did on the boat. So every, I knew the systems pretty much, not quite as well as them, but uh, if there was ever a problem, I just had to give them a call and I could talk to them any time of day. And there's the boat without a mast, but um, that was intentional. They were going over the rigging that time. This is Maria Del Rey, the day I left. Um, it's a common misconception that when you're heading out to sail around the world, you probably have no fears. But um, my biggest fear is public speaking, which is why this day was so terrifying. Another one of my fears is sharks. I don't know if it's safe to say that anymore, though. <laughs> um, it was, I, I was really looking forward to finally getting out on my trip, but I had this little bit of a bump I had to get over first. I had lots of cameras and lots of people and they were all looking at me and yeah it was that was a rough morning top of that i'd had a cold the day before hadn't slept in a while you know it was a rough time eventually i got out onto the water and you know, it was great send off tons of people i had support all over the world which is the ama amazing thing i didn't entirely realize that because i wasn't around it i was out in the middle of nowhere for a long time but once i did finally get to land i realized just how much support there was back home which is really amazing first few days out on this major trip, and it was really exciting. It wasn't too long before I realized that there was some trouble with all of the charging systems. I, there had been some miscalculations, and I wasn't going to have enough fuel to get myself all the way around the world. So I pulled into Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. We uh, did a ton of work there. You know, my whole team came down. It was, it was actually a really fun stop. You know, it was kind of hard to wrap my mind around being just a couple days out and already realizing I was going to have to stop. It turned out to be great. You know, my dad and everybody was there going over all the systems. And the night before leaving Cabo, I actually looked really terrified there. I wasn't as terrified as I looked, but um, I was going over the weather, seeing, you know, what I was going to have to do, where I was going to go, if I was going to have any wind the day I left. And there I am pulling out again. It was a rough time pulling out. Energy management and power management is a big deal. Especially, you know, you've got these huge sails, and once, if they get overloaded or something like that happens, it throws a lot of stuff off. And a big problem I had on my trip was my autopilots. They never worked all that well, and so a big gust would come and they would automatically just turn off. They couldn't handle any load at all. But this is on the equator. It's a nice place. I, I can't decide what I liked better, freezing down south or being boiling hot on the equator. 
And I'd probably take the storms over the no wind and listening to sales flog for, you know, day after day. I had a great time out on the ocean. A lot of people wonder how you deal with the loneliness and all that. But for me, it wasn't a big deal. I grown up sailing and so it was, was kind of, I was having fun out there. It wasn't too long out that, uh, well actually this is Cape Horn. I rounded that when I was yeah, 16 and a little bit, but uh, the youngest person to round Cape Horn, which was a pretty exciting deal because um, you know, it's considered the Mount Everest of sailing and a lot of people had said I wouldn't make it a week out and there I was three weeks into the trip sailing around Cape Horn. I actually had perfect weather when I sailed around Cape Horn, which is very unusual. I had amazing weather routers. In fact, once they actually made me turn around just so we could time getting around the horn just right. So uh, down south, you get a lot of storms. It can be fun as long as, as long as you're able to keep the boat up well, which that occasionally got a little bit hard. But that is a squall. They, um, they're not that bad as long as you can see them coming. Occasionally you get into one and you, you didn't really see it coming and then things get a little bit messy. Bad things only happen at night when you're on the boat. Two in the morning when you haven't slept, that, that's when everything starts falling apart. You know, and you, you can't think straight and all that. There is my wonderful autopilot. I uh, actually named my autopilot Edward after the vampire from the movie because it was temperamental and it was continually trying to kill me. <laughs> It, in fact, it tried to kill me so many times that we decided I had to pull into Cape Town, South Africa for repairs. I wasn't wanting to head out into another ocean while I was just, you know, waiting around for these things to break down again. So I uh, pulled in there. It was a little bit rough getting in. It calmed down a lot, but um, right as I was pulling into the channel, I turned on the engine. The engine didn't seem to be working so well, and all of a sudden I started coughing black smoke, and a few seconds later it was dead. That's not the most fun thing in the world. Luckily, there was a boat tied up next to me and towed me in. Uh, the guys from my team hopped on board, and you know, I got to talk to my mom on a phone that wasn't, you know, connection wasn't failing every 30 seconds for the first time in three months. I also got to walk on dry land, sleep in a dry bed, and talk to people again, which was pretty amazing. I mean, I'd always been a little bit shy, never really a people person, but three months alone at sea, that can make anybody appreciate people. <laughs> So my, my brother and my dad flew down there, and that, that's why my engine died right there. That was fun. So we started working on the boat. A couple of guys from my team were down there. There's Wild Eyes. She um, was a little beat up, but any boat would be after a trip like that. This is an example of what, what my team members will do for me. There uh, was a leak in the ballast tank, which is a little bit of a problem, especially when it's leaking into the boat. You know, it's really cold and having water on the floor is pretty miserable. It's hard to keep these boats dry, but we were doing our best job. And so took the little window of the, the water ballast tank off and this guy crawled in there and hung upside down for a good couple of hours just to, you know, try and fix that. Uh, about two weeks and I was leaving Cape Town. I, of course, I, I got a little bit of wind to put on a show, but um, as it seems to be a trend with my sailing, I got to make a grand exit of, you know, two knots or so. Maybe not even that. Uh, at least there was enough to fill the sails this time. Was, when I left Maria Del Rey, it was just flogging all over the place. But um, not very impressive, really. There's Charlie. I wasn't sure if I could qualify as single-handed because I had another buddy on board, but uh, seeing as he had wings, I decided I was still just my hands. And that's, that's the highest level of insanity I ever reached. I never spoke to him. I occasionally yelled at the engine when it broke down, but um, never spoke to the bird. And the bird never spoke back, which is, you know, a big thing when you're, you know, trying to figure out how crazy you actually are. Out of Cape Town and on my way again, it was a rough time getting back to life at sea. When I had left Mina Del Rey, I'd kind of had an easy time. It was warm out. There wasn't a lot of wind. But leaving Cape Town, just a few days out, I was starting to get slammed pretty bad. Storm after storm was coming through, and I had barely enough time in between them to patch the boat back together. It was a little bit rough. I was just, you know, hanging in there. I'd get through a storm, then I'd have to stay up all night, patch the boat back together, and get on my way again. Also, another bit of a problem that happened out of Cape Town was my mainsail got stuck right up there at the third spreader. And that's way too much sail up for some of these storms I was getting in. And it was, of course, in the middle of the night when everything goes wrong on a boat. I was trying to get a mast in this pretty gnarly storm. 
and it was pretty much impossible. Luckily, I decided just to go Hope 2 for the night, um, which is a good thing because sailing solo and trying to get up the mast is probably one of the most dangerous things you can do. I was sailing along, I was headed to a light patch of wind where I could get up the mast. I was on the phone with my mom, I was outside and just looking around and looked up the mast and the little line that had been stuck around the spreaders, it wasn't there anymore. So I, you know, just hang on a second, mom, set the phone down and it just all came right down right there. So this huge ordeal that had gotten me off track for days, just all of a sudden, like, just like that was fixed. I was back on my way, I uh, headed back down south a little ways and you know, before long I was Getting, getting slammed again, and um, I've never seen a rogue wave, but I'm um, pretty sure that's what they look like. <laughs> Something like that. They're, they're, they're scary looking, whatever they look like. I felt a rogue wave. I was you know, back into some storms, having a little bit of a rough time, but uh, that is what ended my trip. That's how my boat wrecked, and that's how you know me, most likely. Yeah, that was a rough night. I had been in a storm all day. It was probably one of the worst storms I'd seen. It had, you know, 60 knots of winds and pretty gnarly waves. And um, I, was, I was having a rough time, but things had calmed down. I had finished fixing my engine and was, you know, it was dark out. I was finished up for the day. And, uh, you know, I was back out sailing along nicely when all of a sudden the whole boat was just picked up and I was thrown across the cabin and hit my head on the gauge just above my bed. And as it started rolling up the side of the cabin, everything went black and I woke up a few seconds later on the roof of my boat. Really, I couldn't believe what was happening. I was sitting on the roof there in my boat, water everywhere, things flying all around, and it was major disbelief. I could not believe what had just happened. As I was sitting there, I knew that my trip was over. My mast was gone, and unless I could jury rig and get someplace, I was stranded in the middle of the Indian Ocean. You couldn't plan this worse if you tried. <laughs> and I, I, I wasn't trying. I really was not. Um, I remember before I left, I was looking at a map and I was looking at this exact place going, you know, right there, nothing can go wrong. You really have to make sure everything goes right here. And uh, that's, that's where everything went wrong. Uh, this is all my emergency gear. I had an EPIRB, which is what saved my life, really. I was, where I got wrecked, I was in the French territory. And during the night, I drifted over into the Australian territory. I set off my apurbs the night, in the, in the night, just after I rolled, and next morning, I was starting to get a little freaked out. I was not sure any plane could get out to where I was. So I was sitting on my chart desk and I started to pray. I mean, what else do you do? I, I was praying that if something was gonna happen, if I was gonna get saved, that, you know, I'd, I'd know. And you know, I kind of laughed at myself at the time. I mean, what's God gonna do, send a homing pigeon? But he did a little bit more than that, because as I was, in the middle of praying, I heard this huge engine, and I jumped outside, and there was this giant passenger plane falling over me. So uh, that, was, that was a good sight. But uh, next day, I got picked up. Yeah, there's, there's the plane. <laughs> and there's little wild eyes. It's hard to spot a boat like that from a plane, and so I was a little bit worried when they flew over and kept on going. Eventually, they came back. They did find me. I spoke to them. My mask was gone. I couldn't really talk to them to explain what had happened, but uh, at least they could see that much. You know, they didn't, didn't think I just lost communication or anything. The boat's pretty beat up. Uh, the thing about the boat was the boom was snapped in half. I had nothing I could jury rig with. In general, you just rig something up and get to the closest land, but in this case, there wasn't really anything I could do. This is La Reunion, the boat that came to pick me up. They're great guys. They uh, took me from there to Kerguelen, freezing cold place, lots of wind. I was like standing in the wind laying down on it. It was pretty cool. They took me, they made me go to the doctor there. All I wanted to do was go see some penguins. I saw these penguins on the beach and like, I wanted to go see penguins, but they made me go to the doctor instead. So, <laughs> no sightseeing. Uh, it's pretty cool to have a Kerguelen stamp in your passport, but I don't know if all that trouble was really worth it. Okay, this is the happiest I ever was to see my brother. I mean, I, I like my brother and everything, but that, that was a good time when he showed up in Reunion Island. And then I was welcomed into the loving arms of the media, who uh, were a little less loving than the last time I'd seen them, surprisingly. I got to go to Paris. Keep in mind, I did not have a mirror on my boat and I'd just been shipwrecked. But uh, the, the Eiffel Tower kind of takes away from the fact that, you know, I was back home again, finally, after all that, all that craziness, and I was back home. My, my little sister's missing there. They uh, stuck my publicist, Lyle, in instead of her. She's much cuter, but uh, 
Uh, that's my little baby brother who was born the morning after I got back while I was giving a press conference in Marina Del Rey. It's a little bit of a crazy time. There's my team members, Scott and Jeff. You know, throughout my whole trip, what I realized was that the biggest part is the team behind it and having those guys supporting me and having the support of the rest of the world. And without, you know, the, the energy and, the, you know, the, the commitment of all these people and all the people following my trip, I never would have been able to do what I did. And so, you know, it was, it was probably the most amazing part of my life. And I'm just so thankful to all the people that made it possible and to any of you guys who followed my trip. So thank you.